1998, a dim office in Redmond, Washington. A lone developer leans toward the glow of his monitor. Three windows fight for space on the screen. On the left, a visual basic form, quick to build but clumsy in execution. On the right, a block of C++ code, powerful yet fragile, riddled with sharp edges. In the center, the system has frozen again. Another crash. This was Microsoft's developer world. Fractured, exhausting, fragile. But beyond the flicker of that screen, a deeper storm was already gathering. Inside Microsoft, Java was no longer just another language. To Bill Gates and his executives, it was a menace. Internal emails spoke of the need to pollute Java to keep it tied to Windows, rather than let it fulfill its promise of running anywhere. That fear soon spilled into the courts. In 1997, Sun Microsystems sued Microsoft, accusing it of deliberately twisting Java into a proprietary Windows-bound tool. A year later, a federal judge sided with Sun and ordered Microsoft to strip the words Java compatible from its products. The ruling humiliated Microsoft in public and exposed the fragility of its control. By 2001, the company settled, paying $20 million and agreeing to freeze its J++ product at an outdated version of Java, effectively killing the project. The tools were breaking. The courts had turned hostile. The company's dominance on the desktop no longer guaranteed trust in its future. Inside Redmond, the question was no longer about innovation alone. It was about survival. Could one new language unify the chaos and restore credibility? The answer would arrive under a new name, c -sharp. By the late 1990s, Microsoft looked unstoppable. Windows powered nine out of 10 personal computers. Office had become the global standard for productivity. Internet Explorer shipped by default and was crushing Netscape in the browser wars. From the outside, it seemed as though Redmond could not be challenged. But inside the company, the picture was far less stable. The war with Sun over Java had left scars. Microsoft's Java tools, once promoted as the future of cross-platform programming, were crippled by lawsuits and settlements. J++ was frozen in place, unable to support new versions of Java. The Microsoft Java virtual machine was eventually discontinued, cut off by legal rulings. Developers who had placed their bets on Microsoft's Java found themselves stranded. The alternatives weren't much better. Component object model that underpinned Microsoft's developer platform had grown bloated and impossible to manage. Debugging it was a nightmare. Deploying it across multiple applications was worse. Developers joked that COM was less a bridge than a trapdoor, and one they kept falling through. Meanwhile, Java itself was gaining momentum. Sun's slogan, write once, run anywhere, promised freedom from the very kind of platform lock-in that had defined Microsoft. With the internet rising, portability mattered more than ever. Enterprises began experimenting with Java for mission-critical systems. Universities started teaching it as the first language to new programmers. Microsoft had the market dominance, but it was losing the narrative. If nothing changed, it risked losing a generation of developers altogether. The turning point came in 1999. In a quiet office on the Microsoft campus, Anders Halesberg assembled a small team. Halesberg was no ordinary hire. In the 1980s, he had built Turbo Pascal at Borland, a product so influential that it helped democratize programming. Later he created Delphi, a tool adored by developers for its elegance and productivity. When he left Borland for Microsoft in 1996, it sent ripples through the programming world. Now Microsoft was asking him to do it again, create a new language that could compete with Java, avoid legal landmines, and unify Microsoft's broken developer story. Three times a week, the team met to hash out ideas, whiteboards filled with syntax sketches, Lines of code were debated as fiercely as lines of poetry. Tempers sometimes rose, but Hegelsberg rarely raised his voice. He had a reputation for listening, waiting out the storm, and then distilling the argument into one clear decision. Some would later call him a benevolent dictator, calm, precise, and unyielding when it mattered. The risks were real. Some engineers worried openly that this would be seen as Java under Microsoft's skin. Lawyers hovered in the background, reminding the team that any similarity to Java might bring Sun back to court. Every syntax choice had consequences. Every feature could be weaponized in litigation. But the work pressed forward. The team refused to prop up Visual Basic one more time. They were tired of patching C++'s sharp edges. Instead, they took the best ideas of the past and reimagined them for a safer, more modern future. Garbage collection was built in, so memory leaks could no longer cripple entire projects. Exception handling was treated as a first-class feature. Type safety was woven into the core of the language. It borrowed familiarity from Java, yes, but it was not a clone, it was a response, and a survival strategy. By 2000, the prototype had shed its resemblance to Java and emerged as something new, something sharper. Before we continue, a quick but important note, because great software isn't just about language design or compiler elegance, it's also about the foundation that keeps your app alive long after you've hit build. 
Enter Convex, the sponsor of this video, a full-stack backend as a service that pairs beautifully with C-sharp's precision and structure. If C-sharp gives you strong typing, asynchronous power, and the clarity of modern language design, Convex gives you the backend muscle to make your apps real-time, dynamic, and scalable, without the boilerplate or brittle infrastructure. And then there's Convex Chef, an AI app builder that doesn't just generate snippets, it understands architecture, Chef wires up authentication, file storage, background jobs, and real-time sync on top of Convex's reactive data model. You describe the app, Chef builds it, fully functional, real-time, ready to deploy. Try it yourself. Head to convex.link slash codesource. Describe the app you want and see how far you can go without writing a single backend line while keeping your core logic in C-sharp. Convex and your code together. That's powerful infrastructure meeting expressive logic. Now, let's get back to the story of C-sharp. In 2000, at the Professional Developers Conference in Orlando, Florida, Microsoft unveiled its vision for the future. It was called .NET, and at its heart was a language with a sharp, simple symbol for its name, C-sharp. The backlash was immediate. Sun's executives accused Microsoft of undermining Java yet again. Developers scoffed that C-sharp was nothing more than Java with curly braces rearranged. The industry press called it a clone war, another chapter in Microsoft's long attempt to control the developer world. Then came a surprising move. In 2001, Microsoft submitted C-Sharp to the European Computer Manufacturers Association. A year later, the International Standards Organization ratified it. For a company long accused of building walled gardens, this was almost unthinkable. Simix dismissed it as a ploy. Advocates saw it as a step toward credibility. Outside Redmond, the drama deepened. Miguel de Icaza, a Mexican programmer and open source advocate, announced Mono, an independent project to bring .NET and C-Sharp to Linux. To some, this was liberation, a way to use Microsoft's technology beyond Microsoft's walls. To others, it was dangerous. Richard Stallman, the outspoken founder of the Free Software Foundation, warned developers to avoid C-Sharp entirely, calling Mono a potential trap. If Microsoft ever decided to enforce its patents, he argued, the entire open source community could be left vulnerable. The reaction was split, some hailed Mono as bold and visionary, others treated it with suspicion, a Trojan horse smuggled into the heart of open source. Yet, inside enterprises, the calculation was simpler. Visual Studio.net offered a cleaner, more unified environment than anything Java had at the time. For businesses exhausted by fragmentation, c -sharp promised relief, and slowly, the language began to climb. As the 2000s unfolded, c -sharp began to shed its reputation as a Java imitator. Each new version of the language pushed boundaries and deepened its identity, though not without controversy. In 2005, c -sharp 2.0 introduced generics, a feature that Java had already adopted. Microsoft's implementation was more ambitious. It supported reified generics, meaning type information was preserved at runtime. Many argued it was cleaner and safer than Java's erasure-based approach. Supporters praised it as a leap forward. Detractors saw it as Microsoft catching up, late to the party, even if they had dressed better. Two years later, c 3.0 unveiled something that stunned the industry. Language Integrated Query, or LINK. Suddenly, SQL-like queries could be written directly inside the language. Developers marveled at its elegance, its ability to treat databases, XML and collections as first-class citizens. Yet critics rolled their eyes, dismissing it as syntactic sugar that tied developers deeper into Microsoft's ecosystem. For every applause at a conference, there was skepticism online. Was this innovation or lock-in disguised as elegance? Then, in 2012 came perhaps the boldest step, async and await. Asynchronous programming had long been one of the most difficult challenges in modern software. Threads were messy, callbacks unreadable, Microsoft's approach turned the problem into something that looked almost ordinary, like writing sequential code. Developers embraced it immediately, calling it revolutionary. But not everyone was convinced. Some veterans worried that hiding complexity under simple keywords would make debugging harder, masking the true costs of concurrency. Each release of C-sharp drew admiration and suspicion in equal measure. Some saw a language growing into maturity, forging its own path. Others still muttered about Microsoft's history, about its lawsuits, about whether innovation was simply another form of control. By the early 2010s, the world had changed. The open source movement was no longer a fringe rebellion. It was the new mainstream. GitHub had become the central hub of software collaboration. Linux powered the cloud. And in that world, Microsoft was still the company many loved to hate. But change was coming. In 2014, under Satya Nadella's leadership, Microsoft made a move that would have been unthinkable a decade earlier. It declared .NET to be open source. Soon after, it released .NET Core, a lightweight cross-platform version of the framework that ran not just on Windows, but on Linux and Mac OS too. For a company once branded as a monopolist, it was nothing short of a revolution. Reactions were mixed. Some applauded Microsoft for finally joining the world it had once fought against. 
Others doubted the sincerity, calling it theater, a rebranding effort to win back trust while still holding the levers of power. The memory of the Java Wars lingered, the scars of lawsuits and branding battles not easily forgotten. Meanwhile, Mono, once treated with suspicion, was absorbed into Microsoft's ecosystem. What had begun as an act of defiance now became part of the official strategy. Developers who had once sworn never to touch Microsoft's technology were suddenly submitting pull requests to its GitHub repositories. Yet whispers remained. Could Microsoft really be trusted? Was this a new chapter or merely a new costume? At the same time, another force was pulling c -sharp into unexpected territory. Unity, the game engine that democratized development for indie creators, chose c -sharp as its scripting language. Suddenly, c -sharp wasn't just powering enterprise software or cloud applications. It was the backbone of an entire creative economy, from small indie studios to billion-dollar gaming franchises. Young developers who had never touched Visual Studio were learning c -sharp through Unity, not for banking systems but for virtual worlds. The transformation was complete. c -sharp had escaped the shadow of Java, survived the skepticism of open source, and now thrived both in boardrooms and bedrooms, in enterprise servers and student dorms. It had become a language of industry and of play. Two decades after its birth, c -sharp had become one of the pillars of modern computing. Banks used it to manage billions in transactions. Hospitals ran it behind electronic health records. Governments relied on it for critical infrastructure. And millions of gamers explored worlds built on C-sharp code, never knowing the language's tumultuous origins. Anders Halesberg, the architect who guided its birth, had since turned his attention to TypeScript, another language that quietly reshaped the way developers wrote code for the web. But the DNA of his design, clarity, safety, and restraint, lived on in C-sharp. Yet the legacy of C-sharp is not without shadows. Its story is still haunted by the controversies of its origin, the Sun lawsuit, the accusations of cloning, the fear of patents, the skepticism of open source. For some C-sharp will always be the child of a monopoly, born in litigation and matured in mistrust. For others it stands as proof of transformation, a language that began in conflict, survived doubt, and grew into something trusted by millions. The developer at the desk no longer juggles three crashing windows, Across millions of screens, in classrooms, studios, startups, and Fortune 500 companies, c -sharp has become part of the quiet architecture of modern life. A language forged in fire, and carried forward even by those who once doubted it most.